it gives me and it gives the Boston Athenaeum a great deal of, of, of pleasure to introduce uh, for the second day in a row uh, Sir Simon Jenkins. Simon Jenkins, as many of you know, uh, spoke here last night uh, about his uh, favorite English country houses. Uh, today's topic uh, uh, by Simon, of course, is something that is quite different. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, particularly in, in the wake of Tuesday's presidential election, uh, his comments today will be, be quite poignant indeed. Um, his announced topic, Bush, Blair, and Iraq, the making of a catastrophe as seen from London, um, speaking directly on the uh, Anglo-American relationship that has grown up with, between Tony Blair and uh, our President uh, George Bush. So um, without further delay, I am very happy to introduce Simon to speak with you today about his topic. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice to be um, uh, greeted by references to the fire exits, as if, uh, <laughs> as if something inflammatory was about to be said. Um, but it's equally nice to uh, change my uh, tone of voice from the highly controversial topic of uh, England's country houses last night, <laughs> um, which left blood on the carpet, um, to the completely uncontroversial topic of Bush, Blair, uh, and Iraq today. Um, I've been terribly aware since arriving in America uh, two weeks ago, and certainly since arriving in Boston two days ago, um, that uh, people from outside um, attending an American election, uh, and particularly attending the results of this American election, do feel like strangers at a wake. Um, uh, one never knows quite what to say uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the distressed relatives, um, other than the ones that aren't distressed, because they've done rather well out of the will. Um, so uh, uh, I, I know this is a very sensitive time, particularly in Boston. Um, uh, all I can say as a Briton is that uh, I have read Boston's history. Um, and uh, when it comes to taking a beating at the hands of the American people, we British know how you feel. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the other two constraints I feel under is that um, uh, one is always told that when one goes abroad that it's frightfully bad form uh, to discuss, let alone meddle in, the politics of your host nation. Uh, I am also told that it's very bad form when you go abroad to criticize the politics of your home nation. Um, it is just not done. Uh, given the title of today's lecture, I'm somewhat hamstrung um, because uh, both maxims uh, require breaking, if I'm going to say anything of any substance at all. So please forgive me if I appear to stray outside the norms of good behavior. Uh, it's not meant, it's just been asked of me by the Athenaeum. Um, the subject is Bush, Blair, and Iraq. Uh, and what I thought I'd do was take them in, if you like, reverse order. Uh, Iraq, Blair, Bush. And say a few things about how I see these three distinct but related phenomena uh, at this particular juncture in world affairs. Um, the situation in Iraq, uh, about which I am not an expert, but uh, like all journalists, you become an instant expert overnight when war breaks out. Um, and I did go there last November, so um, I'm as up-to-date as last November and debrief our correspondents at the Times whenever they come out, um, lastly last week indeed. Um, it's no good my pretending uh, to this audience or any audience. I have always regarded the Iraq war as one of the most ghastly errors uh, undertaken by the Western powers since the Second World War. Um, and that embraces quite a few errors. Um, so uh, about, about this, I'm not going to be mealy-mouthed. Uh, I, I uh, went briefly as a correspondent to Vietnam many, many years ago. I watched Beirut unfold, and I can only tell you that Iraq is worse than both. Uh, you're looking at a situation which did not call for any of the actions that have been taken in Iraq. Uh, I do not regard, and I don't think most people who had um, reasonably close knowledge of the country at the time, uh, Saddam Hussein, t in the year 2002, 2003, to have constituted a serious threat to the world. He just didn't. Um, uh, and as such, um, there was no justification in international law or self-defense for the um, preemptive invasion of that country. Uh, certainly, he was less of a threat than he had been in the 1980s, 
uh, when he invaded Kuwait in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, when, of course, we were supporting him. I use the word we here uh, throughout what I say to embrace the coalition of America and Britain. Um, at that time, you could have argued that he should have been, in some sense, put down. Um, but by the end of the 1990s, uh, any sensible intelligence would have revealed that the man was not in any longer a threat to world or regional peace or stability. Nor, frankly, do I believe he constituted some unique, uh, horrific humanitarian threat to his own people. Um, by the uh, early part of the uh, 21st century, uh, the Kurds were now more or less separate under the protection of, uh, of the West. Um, the chief threat he posed was to the Shias in the south of his own country. Um, the chief reason for that threat was that America had promised them security if they rose up against him after the Gulf War, a promise that was not kept. Um, and Saddam, understandably nervous for his position, did wreak terrible vengeance on them. But even then, um, the, the man was no worse than uh, the rulers of Syria, um, currently in America's reasonably good books, or at that time in America's reasonably good books. Or one could name a thousand dictators around the world, um, many of them, like the current brutal dictator of Uzbekistan, one of America's closest friends. Uh, so if we're playing this game, we've got to be very careful of the language we use. As far as I'm concerned, there was nothing about Saddam Hussein that made him uniquely special to require um, the, the massive invasive power that the coalition unleashed on him um, two years ago. Um, I also think that if we are using, uh, albeit now as an ex post facto justification, the concept of humanitarianism as the reason for intervening in another country, um, then we, uh, you just simply have to be very careful how you use it. Uh, one of the principles of almost all moral intervention is that it should be in some sense universalizable, that Kant's old principle. Um, it was justified in Bosnia. I think it was justified in Kosovo, provided it was done on the ground, um, because there was a humanitarian crisis in the process of taking place at that moment in time. And to that extent, you are justified, I think, in going in. It was even justified to an extent in Beirut and in Somalia, uh, two other American interventions that ended in tears. Um, but there was justification for it. There really was not in Iraq. Uh, and therefore, one is left with this great puzzle, this conundrum of why did it happen? Uh, what on earth was going on? Um, and one of the things I find impressive about uh, American journalism is that I can now go into any branch of uh, Borders or Barnes and Noble and pick up about 20 books uh, that try to answer that question written within the last six months. Um, it's, uh, there are many things about my country I love and uh, admire, but we don't smash the other side quite like American writers do um, when, uh, when trouble's in the air. Uh, it was a great example, I think, of how weak the case was for the invasion of Iraq. That as we now know, the intelligence case for it was both felt to be important and was subsequently shown to have been shallow. Uh, it seemed to me to be a, a, a very good um, demonstration that this was something about which those people who undertook it were never particularly sure. And the endless changing of the scenario uh, ever since is an illustration of that. Now, as for Iraq today, um, uh, I, I can't tell you what an awful place it is. Um, I can't tell you, and you can't know, because no one can report it. Uh, it is as about as anarchic a place as I've ever been on Earth. Um, it is a place completely without security. Uh, the nearest you get to security is um, a, a friend with a gun at your gate uh, or your street association with guns at the end of the street. Um, people can't move about. Uh, forget Westerners who can't move about. Uh, ordinary Iraqis can't move about. Professional people are perpetually being kidnapped and then ransomed for money. The simplest way of financing your local militia is to kidnap the local doctor and let him go for $1,000 a week later. Um, this is total anarchy. Um, street lights don't work. Uh, people go the wrong way around roundabouts. Uh, there's no insurance. So if you crash your car, you're done for. You better shoot the other guy and steal his car. Um, I've never been somewhere with such um, a total collapse of civil order as there is in Iraq at the moment. Um, the theory that the Western powers or the coalition powers, or frankly, America and Britain, are in some sort of occupation of the country is itself a misnomer. 150,000 American troops are spending almost all their time defending 150,000 American troops, uh, supplying them, uh, protecting them, keeping them in their bases, 
uh, I am genuinely impressed by the bravery of the American troops who actually go out on patrol. These patrols are completely pointless. Um, they are going into enemy territory, like, like into Indian territory, to um, kill a few people in retaliation for something. They're putting themselves at huge risk. The casualty rates, you hear about the deaths, but the injuries are just appalling. Um, the casualty rates are very, very high by almost all known um, occupation armies. Uh, and uh, this is being done by American troops against, as far as I can see, intolerable odds and no hope of success. So it is a terrible state of affairs. Um, I will come at the end of what I say to what I think should happen next. But let me switch now uh, from the terrible state of affairs to Blair. Uh, any Briton in America um, is greeted with two uh, very contrasting responses when they're uh, announced it's coming from Britain. Uh, one is, you know, a, a hug, a kiss, and say, we think you Brits are absolutely lovely to stay by us. Uh, the other is very different. It's a look of stupefaction. Uh, and the question, why on earth did your nice left-wing prime minister get himself involved in this terrible mess? Um, and the responses that one gives to these two uh, statements have to be, I have to say, somewhat different. <laughs> because they um, the second question being much more often asked in my country, it's perhaps a more creative one to try and answer. Tony Blair got himself involved in this terrible mess. Um, I like to think against his better judgment, but I'm not totally sure, um, because he began by believing, as all British prime ministers believe, and traditionally, historically, rightly so, that Britain and America must always stand together. It was no more sophisticated than that, but that is enough. In almost all world crises, we have stood together. Uh, we have not stood together quite like this. Um, we didn't in Vietnam. Um, there have been situations in which we've distanced ourselves from American intervention. But broadly speaking, Britain and America have stood together. And that standing together, of course, means through thick and thin. When uh, the Afghan adventure took place, for two weeks beforehand, after 9-11, Tony Blair and his entire team had tried to stop the Americans going to war in Afghanistan. There was a terrific operation around the world to try and mobilize Arab opinion to spring Osama bin Laden from the hills of Afghanistan uh, and to do a deal of some sort with the Taliban. It didn't work. Uh, when the war in Afghanistan was declared, Britain supported it, although I know for a fact that Britain was very worried about it. When uh, this moved on towards Iraq, there's no doubt at all that London was appalled. But Tony Blair was trapped. And I think that the answer to the question, how on earth did that nice Tony Blair going to get himself involved in this mess, is he simply found himself trapped. But uh, very important to understand about my Prime Minister, he is a lawyer. A uh, profession for whom I have a great respect, but um, once they picked up the brief, they run with it. And Tony Blair, I think, totally persuaded himself. This was a good brief. He liked George Bush far more than he liked Bill Clinton, I may say. Uh, he took to him. He um, shares many of his assumptions, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But certainly when George Bush said to Tony Blair, we think Iraq is a threat to the world, um, and we want uh, to go into Iraq, and we want you to be with us, I don't think it really occurred to Tony Blair to say no. He was always going to be inside the famous tent. Uh, and it didn't really matter that Tony Blair also had a subplot, which is that he wanted to lead Europe. And indeed, at one point, promised George Bush that he would bring Europe with him uh, into this tent and failed utterly, completely, and humiliatingly. Um, but uh, as far as Blair was concerned, there was no option but to go ahead with whatever it was that America was proposing to do. I think in this respect, he was almost alone, not just in the British government, but in the entire British establishment. Uh, hardly a single British ambassador abroad was anything other than appalled. The two senior ministers most concerned with foreign affairs, uh, Robin Cook and Claire Short, both resigned. Uh, every other minister you spoke to said, nothing to do with me. That's Tony. That's Downing Street. But... Prime Minister in Britain has absolute power. I cannot overstress this. If you're the Prime Minister of Britain, you have a power way beyond anything that an American president has, because there's no check or balance. 
he has um, control over his government. He has control over everybody's jobs, everybody's careers. He has control over his own House of Commons because he has a majority in the House of Commons. I myself am still amazed that he had less trouble than he had with the House of Commons. This, after all, is a Labour Party. Uh, it, it, it is historically phenomenal that the war on Iraq was supported by a majority in the House of Commons uh, composed of Labour MPs, um, people traditionally of extremely stern uh, views on things like following America into um, illegitimate foreign interventions. But it was the case that Tony Blair was able to carry with him his cabinet. He was able to carry with him uh, MPs in the House of Commons. Uh, he did not carry uh, the British people wholeheartedly. The British people currently are not overwhelmingly, but I think latest figure 60% against uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, Tony Blair didn't care. Tony Blair would say with absolute passion, I believe in the depths of my being this is the right thing to do. Uh, there was no nonsense about we've got to do it because the Americans do it. Tony Blair was very firm. I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. And he has a lot of trouble, as your president does, with the um, bereaved families of dead British servicemen. Um, and he's very good at handling it. He says this was the right thing to do. We are fighting for freedom. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that through all this, at the next election, which is going to be next May probably, Tony Blair will not face anything like the challenge that George Bush faced from his opponents on the subject of the war. Tony Blair, I, my touch word, is going to win. Uh, he's going to win uh, not because of Iraq. He's going to win in spite of Iraq. But he will win. Uh, he'll win because um, he is, uh, I have to say, in many respects, uncannily like your president. Uh, he is um, a firm believer uh, in uh, the war on terror, about which he talks with the same implausible rhetoric. Um, he is a firm believer in family values, which he talks about which he talks with slightly more plausible rhetoric. Uh, but the phraseology is there. Uh, he is a man essentially of the right, not of the left. Um, his uh, hijacking of the Labour Party, I repeat, is a phenomenon of history rather than something that emerged naturally out of Labour. Um, it did arise out of a desperate craving on the part of the Labour Party to win an election, and Tony Blair was the man to do that. But he, is, he fights his politics from the right. He gives money, uh, runs up deficits to uh, middle-class groups like drivers and farmers and house owners. He's very keen on privatizing everything in sight. Uh, he is in no sense a figure of the left. But he's a nice guy, he's very plausible, um, he's very appealing. Uh, if he was standing here, he'd have you in the palm of his hand, I can assure you. Uh, this man is a very effective politician. And the, uh, the sense in which uh, Bush may or may not represent the new politics in America is the same sense that Blair represents a sort of new politics in Britain uh, and an effective one. And he's also helped, of course, by the almost complete inability of the Conservative Party uh, either to outflank him on the right uh, or to find a leader capable of being more plausible than he is. So you do have um, a very remarkable set of affairs in Britain uh, politically um, and it's one that plays uh, very much into the hands of Tony Blair in pushing through the very unpopular policy on Iraq that we're discussing uh, this afternoon. Now lastly, uh, the third of my trilogy of topics, uh, George Bush. And here I really do trade with very great care because... Uh, I think the maxim um, uh, is a, a valid one, that you shouldn't talk about other people's politics uh, when you're their guest. Um, but I think it would be less than fair to all of you <laughs> if I didn't try. Um, it is unquestionably the case that most Europeans were appalled at George Bush's victory. You only have to read your own newspapers to see that. Um, it wasn't that they expected it or didn't expect it. I think they didn't expect it. Um, they just were amazed. Uh, and they're now reeling, stunned uh, from the fact of it and trying to work out what it means. Um, one group, mostly politicians, are trying to work out what values politics means, um, what uh, use can be made by the political class of the politics of scare. Uh, the old uh, tradition, which is that you won elections by um, promising the electorate good times ahead, appear to be over. You promise them horrible times ahead unless they vote for you. Uh, this, to my mind, is an alarming sort of new politics, but it's undeniably effective. 
And if I was a, a, a Karl Rove of Britain, I'd be worrying myself very seriously about what this means. Um, but a different sort of concern in Europe is obviously, what does this mean for the outside world? And I think it's to that that I can more uh, appropriately address my remarks. I don't think Europeans have yet come to terms, or I think Europeans are slowly coming to terms, with a total change in the relationship between most of the world, but certainly Europe and America. My generation, whatever we may have said about Americans or American presidents or American actions around the world, always regarded America as a solution to a problem. Uh, America would be there. Uh, when push came to shove, if we needed America, um, it would do the right thing. As Churchill said, it would try all the wrong things first, um, but eventually it would do the right thing. And certainly uh, for I mean, writers of my generation, um, that was always the bottom line. You end up with that line, thank God for America. I think you'll find that a new generation of Europeans do not take that view anymore. Uh, the chief reason is the Cold War is over. Uh, it was the Cold War that gave you that bottom line. Uh, whatever else is going wrong, at least uh, the Russians do constitute a sort of threat. I was persuaded of that myself, and I still believe it. Um, they do constitute a, a, a proto-imperialist menace. Uh, we do need to stand firm against them. I was never a left-winger. I was never CND. I had no problem at all about uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, and I did regard uh, the American deterrent as the ultimate defense of the West. And I was thankful for it. And would always say so whenever uh, offered the opportunity. I think most Europeans now regard, or younger Europeans now regard America as a problem. They simply regard it as a problem. Um, what on earth are they going to do next? How is it going to impact on us what they do next? The, uh, the war on terror is just not something that most Europeans feel in the way that it's been articulated in America, and to some extent by Tony Blair. Yes, uh, we've got dissident gangs, uh, mafias. Uh, we have uh, Muslim fundamentalists, and some of them have bombs, and sometimes they do terrible things like bomb, bomb Madrid underground station. But the Red Brigade bombed Milan uh, station. I mean, these things we've had to grapple with before, as, uh, as, as threats of violence. Um, the nature of it is different, uh, we accept. Uh, there is, in a sense, a movement behind it emerging from parts of the Middle East, or I have to say only parts of the Middle East, and to that extent it needs to be uh, guarded and watched. But most European countries would much rather do it themselves than do it the American way. And I think the result of this has been that, that, that a lot of Americans, and a lot of the Europeans, and a lot of European governments simply are rather frightened, and they're particularly frightened now, of what America will do in answer to what America perceives as being a global war on terror. A war that, they recognize the war from communism. They don't recognize this war. They know terrible things get done by terrorists. But a war on terror implies, in the first place, it implies a state. Uh, there is no state that's committing the war on terror. Uh, but secondly, it is not um, systematic. It is not, there's no front at which you fight. Um, the way in which you contest it is through uh, crime prevention, through detective work, through intelligence, uh, of which most European countries have a certain skill, as does America. Um, the fact is, since 9-11, uh, nothing quite as terrible has been done. Uh, and so one does wonder whether it wasn't just a one-off from a particular group. Uh, what is Al-Qaeda really? Um, are there all these people training in bases? Well, a lot of people in my profession are now questioning all these assumptions. But either way, we've got to try and work out what it is that America's doing things like invading Iraq and now talking about other invasions uh, to prevent, because we don't recognize that threat. And I think this uh, change from regarding America as a solution to regarding America as a bit of a problem is one that's going to have profound effects on the relationship between Europe and America, and, and indeed much of the rest of the world in America. Um, it is alarming to friends of America to travel elsewhere and find, quite frankly, such a degree of hostility uh, to Americans. Um, I mean, expressed in almost day-to-day -day relationships. People insulting Americans in shops. Um, people sending letters to newspapers of, of an extraordinary level of abuse. Um, a country which I love and, and I have tremendous feeling for.
And I know many Americans feel the same way about it as I do. And I keep on saying, never use the word Americans. Uh, never use that word. Indeed, when I was in Iraq, um, people would say, please don't refer to the Americans in Iraq. Refer to the Pentagon. Um, and indeed, I once started rewriting every reference to the um, American government or occupation of Iraq as the Pentagon occupation of Iraq. And so a dear friend of mine in the Pentagon grabbed me by the lapel and said, please stop referring to the Pentagon occupation of Iraq. It's the neocon group in the Pentagon's operation in Iraq. <laughs> uh, and uh, for that, I think, there's a, there's a measure of truth. But for the time being, the, um, the focus of this concern is Iraq. It is what is happening in Iraq. It is what might happen as a result of Iraq, and it's where we go after Iraq. And as far as that's concerned, um, I take the view that the situation as of now in Iraq is simply unsustainable. Um, I repeat, this is not a country in occupation. This is a country in which America has bases it's trying to defend. There is no sense in which there's an Iraq state anymore. It's a fragmented country of, uh, of um, townships, statelets, um, sheikdoms, uh, mafia groups. It's, uh, it's a territory in a state of anarchy. It is not a country in occupation by another country, uh, the coalition. Um, and to that extent, it has uh, a relatively short and extremely turbulent um, lifestyle attached to it. Uh, now, I took the view in print and got roundly condemned for it um, that actually getting out of Iraq, which is now um, an inevitability, um, would be slightly easier for George Bush than for John Kerry. Uh, I felt that John Kerry, if he had won the election, would have had the most awful time over Iraq. In the first place, there would have been a holocaust of bombs going off everywhere to test him. Um, he would have had to have reacted to them fairly violently. That violent reaction would have been even more counterproductive than the other violent reactions would have been. He would then have tried to get the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Russians, and more of us to send troops there, and we would have rebuffed him. He would have been humiliated thereby, but couldn't have left because if he left, the Republicans would have slayed him. You're betraying all our dead. I think John Kerry would have had the most appalling time in Iraq. Now, it, it may, may be a born of hope on my part, but I think that George Bush will be realizing fairly soon that if he can stage anything like a respectable election next January, and that's pretty moot, but if you can just get a few photographs taken by some brave Arabs um, <laughs> of somebody going to a polling booth, uh, and uh, Ayad Alawi can be kept alive that long. I mean, these are not funny remarks. These are just only too true. Um, that you could say uh, at the end of January, we've done our bit. Uh, we got rid of the, the thuggish dictator. Um, we've liberated the Iraqis, and we've given them an election. Now they're on their own. And withdraw to base, and then gradually scale down your operation and just get out. Um, that, to my mind, would be the sensible thing to do. And I do think that George Bush, were he so minded, um, would find it easier to do than John Kerry would because he at least could articulate the language of withdrawal as being victory and he wouldn't have the Republicans uh, calling him a traitor uh, over to his right. Um, now, this may well be a fantasy on my part, but at least it, 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 it hangs together as far as I'm concerned. And I do think that uh, when that happens, because sooner or later something like that will have to happen, um, I, I honestly don't think the American army is prepared to occupy Iraq like the French Foreign Legion in the, in the Sahara Desert with a series of fortresses dotted around the desert um, with vast costs involved in trying to supply them um, and a sitting target for people, for people to lob uh, RPGs in over the walls every night. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Um, but I do think that the outcome of this is going to be um, the disintegration of Iraq. Uh, I have no doubt at all. Kurdistan is already a separate country. You have to show your passport um, on the road, on the days when you could go up the road, uh, in order to get into it. Um, and the rest of the country will divide up into the Sunni and the Shia areas. And they will probably splinter, um, because there's no real sense in which you'll be able to get a regime that uh, governs them with any degree of unity. Uh, and at that point, all the surrounding states are going to start worrying. Uh, the Saudis will be worrying, the Iranians will be worrying, the Iranians will be triumphant. Um, the Syrians will certainly be worrying um, because the Ba'athists there will be forming new links with the Ba'athists in Fallujah and the Triangle. Um, and the Turks will be 
paranoid about what's happening in Kurdistan. So whatever you've done, you won't have stabilized Iraq. On the other hand, um, as uh, you and we have done in Yugoslavia, um, somehow or another, uh, we accepted the Balkanization of Yugoslavia, and this morning your government recognized Macedonia, uh, indeed recognized it being called Macedonia, which is about as inflammatory a thing you could do to the other Macedonia as you could imagine. Um, but here we are with a country um, riven with internal tribal disputes, now composed of Slovenia, Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro soon, Serbia, um, everything that we supposed we weren't going to do when we watched Tito die and that country begin to fall apart, uh, we've done. And we've seemed to have accepted it. And we will accept a fragmented Iraq. I have no doubt at all about it. At that point, um, I come to my optimistic conclusion. Um, I'm not totally sure this is altogether a bad thing. I think that Iraq, which was an invention of my country, um, was only uh, sustainable as a country under a very strong secular leader. Um, ironically, what the Americans would rather like it to have now. Uh, one mischief is tends to think, well, there is quite a good, strong secular leader sitting in a prison outside uh, Baghdad airport. Um, uh, and I'm sure he'd gratefully accept a reappointment. But um, uh, the fact was that, um, that the new Iraqi people are going to find life under the new fragmented Iraqi state that wasn't or isn't um, I think every bit as unpleasant as it was under Saddam Hussein. Uh, and one thing's for sure, women will have a far worse time than they had under Saddam Hussein because he was a secular leader and he imposed a secular rule on that community and it won't be like that under the Shia Ayatollahs, that's for sure. But uh, it will be um, a new state of affairs which the world will have to grapple with. Uh, I think it will pose a much greater threat to Israel, which I know is an American concern. And I have to say I don't think that's a bad thing because that will be a new realism in the relationship between Israel and its surrounding territories. But, because I like um, things to be resolved, even real politique to be resolved, uh, I would like to think that this will seem to have been a bizarre adventure by a relatively small group of people in America, so-called neocons, who succeeded briefly uh, and brilliantly in capturing uh, first the Pentagon, then the Republican Party, then a sizable chunk of the American government, but by no means all of it, you know, the State Department, um, and thereby launched a sort of Jameson raid, if you know about British history, uh, capturing a country, Iraq. It didn't work. Two or three years later, they had to get out. Um, they left it worse than it was before. Do not worry, the British Empire is littered with examples like this. Uh, and at the end of it, you are older, wiser, if not more sensible. But at least it's over at a certain point. Uh, and I would like to think that, that coming out of this whole experience, you do have um, a uh, Bush administration, if it happens within the terms of the Bush administration, <coughs> which simply learned a lesson. Don't do things like this. If you do them, don't do them this way. It seems to me very unlikely that the uh, neocons, if they survive reappointment, uh, will go on to Iran. Um, let me tell you one thing. Iran is not Iraq. Uh, Iran is a serious country. Um, someone said to me, I I Iraq is Rhode Island. Iran is California. Um, I I you do not declare war in Iran, unless you're mad, um, let alone um, North Korea or wherever. But I think probably as has happened so many times before, after Vietnam, after Beirut and so on, my impression is that America will draw in its horns. It will think, well, let's say we did the right thing, but it's over. Uh, let's now uh, retreat. Let's now look at the world a different way. Uh, let's form some sort of accommodation with the new world order. Um, I think Europeans will realize that they didn't need America as they needed America before, and by the same token, don't need to be rude about America as they felt they need to be rude about it now. Uh, and we will see um, a calmer uh, world set of relationships uh, as a result of what I think will be the failure of the Iraq adventure. Um, it, it was Voltaire, my great hero, who said, um, there comes a point when we must just go and cultivate our garden and I think that cultivating our garden is what we're both going to learn to do after this fiasco.
Thank you very much. Let's take the one at the back there, yes, that lady there. Well, they may be the only people that vote. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it'll make a lot of difference. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've just seen a, a, a wonderful free election in Afghanistan, um, and I imagine we'll see much the same in, in Iraq. I have to say, if, if, uh, it's, it's, inc it's inconceivable that Ayad Alawi wouldn't win this election. I mean, he's not a fool. Um, so uh, I really don't think it matters very much. Um, I, I have to say, it would be, I mean, I, I've done debating on this subject occasionally, and there's usually a, an enraged Iraqi in the audience, may well be one here today, um, who gets up and uh, assaults me for being so um, skeptical about the downfall of um, Saddam Hussein, which is why they left. I do tend to say, well, if we've liberated your country, why haven't you gone back? Um, and I do slightly feel that these people who uh, are, are still overseas, and there are more Iraqis overseas since the invasion than there were before, let me say, um, I'm not inclined to, to be too sympathetic towards them. I think they probably should go home and vote there. But um, anyway, uh, this lady here, yes. I think the media have a, have a substantial role in the drumbeat to war. Um, they, they do, there's no doubt about that. I think when you've got, um, it's a strength of democracy that when people go to war, the, the, if not the media, that the people tend to get patriotic. Um, it used to be said that democracies will never go to war. War is so awful that no democracy would ever fight. Only dictatorships would fight. So I'm not totally averse to the concept of the media being pro um, our troops. Um, I I, well, I, I know what happened here, and I'm, I, I'm aware of that concern. Um, if it's any comfort, it sure as hell wasn't the case in Europe. Um, so, uh, so, no, I mean, I, I, that was worrying, um, particularly when papers like the New York Times and Washington Post, who I sort of thought would have been over against Fox and USA Today, um, w would have been more skeptical, when there was so much to be skeptical about, I have to say. That said, um, if I want to read about Guantanamo Bay now, I read it in the New York Times. They do the, they do the investigative journalism. Uh, they're taking apart the um, WMD MD claims. So there's, a, there's an upside as well as a downside to the media. Uh, yes? And what kind of the Iraq oil is that Iraq oil. I, I'm not sure. I'm now skeptical of the theory that this is all about oil. However, if you go into any Arab capital, they will say, I mean, they'll say two things. One is that 9-11 was Mossad, or the Americans. Believe you me. And secondly, Iraq is all about oil. Um, and then, of course, when you say, well, it just isn't true, they'll say, well, most Americans think that 9-11 um, was about Saddam Hussein. So we're dealing with, we're dealing with huge imponderables here. Um, I'm absolutely sure that, that within the neocon, well, I know from reading, that within the neocon um, agenda, securing oil supplies was a part of the equation. But that doesn't justify going to war with Saddam, because Saddam would have given you the oil without going to war with him. Um, uh, so I've never, never really bought that. I have to say, when you drive into Baghdad, it is quite astonishing to see these blackened uh, ministry buildings sitting in the desert outside Baghdad, all of them looted, I mean, all of them just destroyed, the whole of the civil infrastructure destroyed, apart from this wonderfully pristine oil ministry, uh, which stands absolutely immaculate, ringed with American tanks. Um, that, that, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> so the argument is wasn't about oil. Yes. Sir.
I have none. <laughs> um, I have none. Uh, I have to say, however, that um, George Bush and those around him, um, when it was abundantly clear that uh, the WMD intelligence was faulty, and congressional leadership, when that was clear, um, in effect admitted it. Uh, grudgingly. Uh, our Prime Minister hasn't. Um, our House of Commons hasn't. Um, I, I, I repeat, we are an elective dictatorship in Britain. Um, you're not. Uh, you have a rumbustious, uh, garrulous, um, contentious um, series of pluralisms, which means that when a few senators see blood, they go for it. And certainly, uh, I, I just admired the fact that when Donald Rumsfeld was in real trouble, he was being roasted by senators. Um, our Secretary of State was getting away with murder, literally. Um, so, um, no, I mean, I take your point, but um, it's the same with us. Um, I'll just take one at the back, the very far back. No, yes. No, I, I don't think so, no. Um, I mean, Lockerbie was, was the fault of the Libyan government. Um, now our great friends. Um, but I, I, I don't think so. I mean, you, you, there, there's an argument, which, which is that, that, that American support for Israel it lies at the root of all this trouble. And there's a lot in that. And certainly, again, if you go to the Middle East, that's what you hear all the time. So do not be under any illusion that American support for Israel lies at the root of almost all of this trouble. Certainly, under, uh, certainly the, the whole background to the Al-Qaeda um, fundamentalist movement. Um, but uh, no. Uh, also, I would say that, that, that generalizations about Europe and generalizations about America should be made with great care. Um, what I've found coming to America over the past two or three years is that America is rather like Britain. Um, there are people who agree with their government and people who disagree with their government. The people who disagree with their government do so ferociously. Um, we are very similar nations, um, which I find great comforting. Um, but it is, it is just not the case that all Europeans think alike. Yes, yes you sir. No, I, I don't think there's a left-wing bone in Tony Blair's body. Uh, there is in Sherry Blair's, and I sometimes feel for him at the end of a tired day <laughs> when he comes home and has to put up with that. Um, but he, he, he comes from the kind of moderate labor um, background, but he went to private school, he went to Oxford, he was a lawyer, he had uh, absolutely no experience of what might be called a, a left-wing background. Uh, but much more important is that the, that the biggest battle of Tony Blair's life was crushing the left in the Labour Party. It was called the Project. And it was phenomenally successful. The unions were simply told to get out. Uh, and, uh, and it was undeniably Tony Blair's greatest moment. Um, having done that, he then realized that the way in which you got elected was by capturing the middle ground. The working classes were a smaller group. Um, you had to go for the middle class. You had to be absolutely sure they, were, they had trust in you, they believed in you. Um, uh, but now, I mean, if, 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 if you'd gone from John Kerry's platform to George Bush's platform and changed the faces, Tony Blair would have been George Bush's face. He really would. I mean, he, he, he appeals to the middle class. He, um, he is very fierce on the, the, the left-wing trade union movement. Um, 
on scroungers, on you know, social security cheats and so on. Um, but he's also very strong on, 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 on what, what you call the, the values agenda. It's obviously less, um, less specific in Britain because um, it's just that we, we don't have quite the same number of people going to church, frankly. But it's certainly uh, a, an important part of the way he looks. It's, it, it's, it's a new politics outlook. Yes, just next door. The question is, what does it mean for the Europeans to be in denial over Bush's re-election? Well, they're shocked. I mean, if that's in denial, that's in denial. I mean, they're just simply shocked. I think they honestly thought that Bush had in some sense stolen the election back in 2000, had wrongly interpreted it as a mandate to be divisive, uh, had wrongly interpreted it as a mandate to go to war, and he'd now get his comeuppance, and he hasn't. He's got legitimacy. Now, that's shocking to a lot of European leaders. Um, I have to say also that, just look at the leaders. The leaders of Italy, Germany, and France are, and I, I say this in the privacy of these surroundings, <laughs> not distinguished men. Um, two of them should be in prison. Uh, and and I, really, I, I really don't think that you would... You would um, necessarily use their responses in public as talisman for what Europe thinks. Um, I think you'll find most Europeans will probably think more or less as I think. Um, they'll think, well, this is surprising. Uh, this is interesting. Um, uh, I wonder where it's going to lead. Um, the one thing they do desperately want it to lead to is out of Iraq, and they want the whole language of terrorism de-escalated. And I think that's what they'd think. I've got so many hands everywhere. The blue, the blue jump is. I think, I, I think it's, it, it goes back further. Um, he, he, when Tony Blair came to office, um, I mean, most of your presidents come to office having um, been a governor or a senator or having some experience of office. Tony Blair had none. He had absolutely none. He'd never run so much as a, a lawyer's you know, clerk. He, uh, he was completely naive. He was actually naive as well as being lacking experience. I mean, he was, he was immature. Uh, when he arrived in Downing Street, he was com absolutely blown out of his mind by the grandeur and the glory of it. It was, it was for those people around him, it was rather worrying. But nothing was as worrying as his first invitation to, to Washington. Um, Clinton put on this huge banquet with Bruce Springsteen and goodness knows who else. Uh, and Blair took all his 30 best friends. Um, there was no room for anyone from the British Embassy. Um, and they came back absolutely as if they'd you know, been to the court of the great Kublai Khan. Um, and the first thing the Blairs wanted, they wanted their own jet, and they wanted a proper house, not number 10 Downing Street, not a number. Um, it was a quite extraordinary period, and Blair became very presidential after that first experience of the Clintons. I think, personally, it then started to go sour. I think he found, he found everything to do with Clinton's private life distasteful. And I think by the end of it, he just thought that Clinton was thrashing around trying to survive. Um, I mean, he was very loyal in public. But I think when he went over and had the first meeting with George Bush, Bush was so different and so straight um, and so um, moral. I mean, he, was, he uses the language that Tony Blair uses. I mean, they're both very religious people. 
Um, and I think, I think at that, that point the relationship just matured. And he thought, well, this is a man I, I, I would like to help and do business with. Um, he was immune to all the back-channel intelligence, which said that he was regarded as a patsy and, uh, and um, he was a poodle and all this. He just seemed to be immune to it. He, just, he, he rather liked talking to George Bush on the phone. I think Bush quite liked talking to someone who wasn't American. He said he was a great guy. <laughs> uh, how are we doing? Yes? Well, uh, I, I think um, anything that resolves what's happening in Iraq um, would be a plus uh, to anything else. Because at the moment, it's such a minus. Um, throughout the Middle East, every night, Al Jazeera and all the other channels are just broadcasting relentlessly, relentlessly uh, anti-American propaganda, you might say. Otherwise, children being pulled from the ruins of houses in Fallujah. Um, I mean, you couldn't have worse publicity for America than what is happening now on television or televised in Iraq. So the answer to your question is that if Iraq can be resolved, that would be a great help all round. Um, I think this word, uh, I mean, I, I'm just a skeptic about the phrase international terrorism. Um, I personally don't believe that there is a, um, you know, Dr. No, um, a great you know, mafia conspirator sitting in some palace somewhere pressing buttons and uh, orchestrating what's happening. There was extraordinary material the Pentagon produced about the, um, the caves of the Tora Bora Mountains, uh, which showed um, you know, elevators and arms dumps and uh, sophisticated satellite communications equipment um, with tunnels leading to other sophisticated... Uh, it's complete fabrication. Um, I mean, they bombed those mountains completely to bits. and I mean, they never found a thing. Uh, it honestly was simply a great lie. And I think uh, when they were doing it with the Russians, it was the truth that the same cast of mind was doing it um, for al-Qaeda. Um, there, is, there is very little evidence that Osama bin Laden trained anybody. I mean, he, had, he operated as a kind of Indian guru in those mountains. He was certainly planning the most ghastly uh, uh, terrorist outrage. No argument about, uh, argument about that. But they were done through agents in Germany or agents in Saudi Arabia or agents somewhere else. Um, and, uh, and I really don't think that um, if you can take the poison of Iraq out of all this, you'll be left with anything much other than some dissident groups all around the world uh, in possession of Semtex. And I'm afraid they'll always be there. Yes? Well, the, 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 this is a question I've learned to be even more hesitant about answering uh, when I'm in America. Um, <laughs> these four walls over ears, I'm sure. Um, no, I mean, it, as I said before, uh, this is the uh, Fonz et Origo of America's problems in the, in the Middle East. There's no question about that at all. And as long as you've got um, a, a militant Israel, um, and you would also say an embattled Israel, uh, you will have trouble. I think the general view is that America is reluctant to put pressure on the militant Israel um, to produce a more moderate Israel, uh, and that reluctance is seen as being, um, so to speak, pro-Zionist, and that attitude of mind uh, is regarded as justification for anti-Americanism throughout the Middle East. So uh, although uh, I could be as optimistic as I liked about what would happen if the Iraq adventure ended, under whatever set of circumstances, um, you will, your, as, you, as you rightly say, be left with Israel. But I think that Israel, the Israel problem is itself a function of is the degree to which Israel feels threatened. I mean, the neocon conspirators, if you can put them that way, began with the Netanyahu group, and they saw Saddam as being the most obvious and immediate threat to Israel. And Saddam was financing, whatever else he wasn't doing, he was financing the suicide bombers' families. So, uh, if I was an Israeli, I'd feel very hostile about Saddam Hussein. I have no argument about that at all. Um, 
but you're quite right. Um, one problem goes away, another problem remains. Um, and I think that, um, that in many ways, if Iraq does go away, uh, then I think that uh, George Bush's greatest challenge would be to see if he can use the current ascendancy of Sharon in Israel to push through at least some change that takes the temperature down. Maybe Arafat going will help that. Um, one thing I'm absolutely convinced by is that if you want to get um, a difficult reform through, it's best done by the faction least likely to tolerate it. In other words, I'd rather have Sharon doing it than um, you know, Barack or someone on the left, because he's more likely to get it through. I think Bush is more likely to get through a tougher policy towards Israel uh, than a Kerry would have been. Um, that's just because that's the way politics tends to work. Uh, right at the back, yes. Well, I, I was, I was, uh, I, I, I lost track of which book I've been reading, um, <laughs> but the uh, the Leo Strauss uh, out of Nietzsche uh, view of nationhood um, as myth uh, supposedly legitimizes the um, fabrication of uh, facts about countries and peoples, and to that extent justifies you in using language in ways that um, a rigid um, empiricist would not use. Um, and so certainly when I listen to you know, George Bush saying America in every community is threatened by a war on terror, and I say to myself that's just not true, I just don't believe it to be true, I can see why he's saying it. Uh, that's what democratic leaders do when they want to get elected. Um, whether you go further than that and say, well, um, there are specific lies which are justified by the circumstances in which uh, countries find themselves, like Saddam Hussein was building a nuclear bomb, a, a truly fantastical statement, I always thought, but one that was um, repeated by very, very intelligent people um, quite widely. Um, there I tend to say as, as, as journalists, well, just prove it to me. If you can't prove it, then you're wrong. Um, I think that, or I sense that in your country and in mine, um, this wretched business of Iraq has distorted language. It has polluted intelligence. It's wrecked the lives of many good intelligence agents. Uh, it really has been an awful business, and I just long for it to be over very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Um, it's probably a good moment to end, but I'll take one more question at, at the back there, yes. Mm. I, don't, I, I don't think uh, America being a problem, not a solution, how does it affect, um, or how will it affect Europe's relations with America? I don't think it'll make a lot of difference, frankly. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's certainly a perceptual change. And I think it will affect um, the, the, the way Europe reacts to America's um, requests for assistance, um, bases, overflying rights, uh, any favors done with international trade treaties. Um, I think they will become much more difficult. Um, on the other hand, in one sense, the view of America as a solution was itself something of a fallacy. Um, I mean, that, that supposedly ended with the end of the Cold War. So we've had a 10-year period of, 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 of adjustment taking place anyway. Um, and because I believe something else is much more powerful, which is the natural affinity between Americans and Europeans, I think that will transcend the uh, friction between governments. There was a very interesting poll done in Europe um, two or three weeks ago as to where... Uh, it was virtually every European country, I'm not even sure it wasn't most sort of world countries, who they wanted to win uh, in the American election. And the answer was 80% of them wanted John Kerry to win. They were then asked a second question. 
Um, do you like Americans? The answer to that was 65, 70% said, yes, we love Americans. We just don't want George Bush to win. And I think that was a relatively sophisticated response. Uh, I think it suggested to me that Americans, um, as people, uh, and indeed American institutions, gosh, we've all got our Starbucks, are, um, are tolerated, indeed liked, uh, in the same sense that I think lots of French people are liked in America, despite uh, last year. Um, and I think this distinction between peoples, companies, firms, students, exchanges, travel, um, is nowadays much more complex and much more mature than the crude relations between governments. Thank you.